Hi, my name is Crystal and welcome to Unlock the Story. My guest today is Karen Burke and she is just a beautiful soul that I've known for quite some time. I've been privileged to have her and her family in my life uh, since I was a teenager and this is just a great moment to sit down and discuss um, just a little bit about struggle and what it means to be a choir director and a musician uh, as well as a teacher. And if you don't know who Karen is, she's going to explain a little bit more at the beginning of our interview, but she is a professor at York University as well as one of the co-founders and choir directors for Toronto Mass Choir. And I am just, I'm so excited. So I don't want to give away too much. Uh, I'll save that for the interview conversation that we had together. But before we get into it, I just want to say that all the videos that you're going to see in this conversation will be linked in this description box so you can make sure to go and check out and experience the fullness of the music that we share in our conversation together as well. If you haven't already, please do hit the subscribe button, that red button down below, um, as well as ring that notification bell. And what that notification bell does is it lets you know every time that we upload here on our channel. And I would hate for you to miss out on any future uploads, the new interviews that are going to be coming out, as well as other fun stuff that we're posting here on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you go ahead, click subscribe, and then ring that bell. And as well, Give us a thumbs up if this video is resonating with you, if you're loving the music, if you love gospel music, if you're expanding your horizons, uh, please give us that thumbs up so we know that you're enjoying this content and we can continue to make more like it. All right, with all that being said, let's get right into my conversation with Karen. Well, welcome Karen to Unlock the Story. We are so glad that you're here and you know, it's really fun for me to bring people into my work life that I've known for a very long time. Our lives have intersected on so many points from going to church together at BBC many moons ago uh, to being neighbors in the same neighborhood and your daughter's around the same age as me. And so we're going through the life stages together of career and being moms and marriage and all of that stuff. And my mom's singing with your choir. There's just so many life connection points. It is mm. such an honor and a blessing to bring you on. So why don't you, for those who don't know who you are and what you do, why don't you just share a, a little bit about what it is that you do? So I... I have been blessed with being able to marry my passion and, you know, and my work life uh, and my training. So I was uh, trained as a classical pianist and a conductor and got into education. And through that, realized that my parallel life of being a gospel music lover and artist were valid. And so they crossed. And when they started to cross, amazing things started to happen in my life uh, and things I never ever thought would happen. So now I'm teaching, I'm, I developed the first gospel music curriculum um, in a post-secondary institution 16 years ago and, and have been at York University as an associate professor. Um, and that's sort of like my work life. Mm -hmm. um, and then also been directing, uh, co-founded and directing the Toronto Mass Choir. Uh, and this is our 32nd season. So those no, are that yeah. long. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. I started when I was two, Krista. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I just, I enjoy the fact that I have that outlet as well. Mm -hmm. um, it gives so many, you know, such great context. And I think, I believe my students enjoy the fact that I'm still out there, still touring, still writing, still recording. And it makes it for a very vibrant uh, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must bring such a, a real element to the, what you're teaching them in the classroom. Um, I'm a Humber grad myself, and I know that that was something that we deeply valued was that our professors were out there working in the field, not just for their context potentially, but also just because what they said had real lived life experience to it and not just theoretical uh, in the classroom style learning. So that must yeah. be an, a, a real enrichment for your students. And a and passion, for right? A mm -hmm. passion that's evident. And I believe that students really do engage with that when you are passionate about your art and sold out to it, so to speak. It makes them be able to be to grasp it and your ideas and to take them seriously. Yeah. yeah. What attracted you to music in the first place? Oh, it, it definitely was in my DNA. You know, my family history is filled with musicians, teachers, and preachers. So, you know, I had to be one, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> end up being, I guess, all three in a way. But yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it's just there. I was always singing, singing with my family since I was three. And, uh, you know, it's just everybody in the family is involved in music, you know, either professionally or, you know, as a as a side thing or their mm-hmm. part of church life. Mm-hmm. So I could never I can't never remember a time when I wasn't doing it. And I think I always wanted to be involved uh, professionally in some way with music. But um, I didn't think I could get paid for it. <laughs> so that was a nice little thing happen. <laughs> Isn't that always the way, though? Oh, I remember feeling the same way. I was like, I want to go into theater, but like, I'll never make money. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yet yeah. here I am, 15 yeah. years later, still working in the industry, making wow. money. <laughs> yeah. It's nice. To, you know, your career, you don't have to shut off your brain when you go to work. You know, that kind of your side of your life, your creative life. And also to find out the university loves it. The more that I do, the happier mm-hmm. they are. So that's, nice. you know, very, very lovely benefit outcome. Mm-hmm. That is so cool. So today, uh, we're our theme is talking about struggle and the role of struggle in in creating work and in working together. And it's so interesting. I thought uh, as well because I, when I sent you the the possible topics that we could discuss today, and, and um, you're asking for a little bit of clarification, and you said, you know, I think of myself not as an individual artist, but within the collective community. Um, I just thought that was so beautiful, <laughs> and I loved that. Um, so why don't you just quickly tell us a little bit about your more general experience of the role of struggle and working with and leading a large choir and a band at the same time? Yeah, because I learned very early on with my own professional, you know, uh, vision that Mm -hmm. I did not enjoy the alone type of artistry, you know, where I was the soloist online or the pianist on stage. It just, it was a very, very scary (laughs) undertaking. (laughs) And, And even though I could do it and I do do it, it's not my place of where I feel most you know, being, being used. What I love doing is putting people forward. And I love Mm -hmm. being able to have that feeling of community, Mm -hmm. uh, being able to do artistry in community. And there's something very special about that. uh, When people are sort of come together with one purpose and, you know, behind the scenes are doing something together and then on stage also still creating and making something very unique. And so I found, I found it to be quite intoxicating um, (laughs) from the, from the, attitude of being involved, like I sang in groups and in choirs, but then when I was able to be the architect of those experiences as well and work in partnership with the Holy Spirit, it just it just was really an amazing journey and something I no one could no one could have ever prepared me for. I would I had to experience it myself. Um, so you know very early on I always wanted to be a piano teacher and I was for 35 years I was you know private piano teacher. And um, and I probably, when I retire, I'll probably go back to it because I do enjoy it. But there was something about uh, my third year at university when I was mentored by a wonderful um, Black uh, female conductor named Denise Narcisse Mayer. She tapped me on the shoulder, basically, and said, you know, you're good at this conducting thing. You should really think of it as a career. And I had never even thought of conducting as a career. You see people waving their arms in front of ensembles, but you know, never occurred to me that it was something I could take on. And it was primarily because of her and her uh, motivation and her recognition of what a, whatever gifts God had given me. And I and followed, followed that path. So yeah, you just never know. You never know. But I'm thankful for those people that could see it before I could. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. It's, it, having mentors and people that just call that force out of you is so important. And I think for any one of us that are in the arts and probably in our careers in general, um, where especially a career that you're passionate about, we all have a story of at least one, if not multiple people that really just kind of called that out in us and said, hey, I see this in you and you can do this too and you should consider it. And, you yeah. know, you, often that's the boost that we needed to, to, to go after it, right? So, yeah. So, so going um, into the role of struggle um, and just thinking about, again, like that, that large choir experience experience and as you said like it's not a you want that communal experience um which resonates with me so deeply like how did was struggling 
something you even anticipated that would be a part of the process? Or did you think like, oh, it's just going to be easy to lead this group of people? Oh, yeah. No, thankfully, I'd had some experience, you know, with groups and ministry and church life (laughs) and all of that before, right? And so I wasn't naive in thinking it was all going to be kumbaya all the time. Um, I don't think I anticipated how difficult it actually could be. But, um, you know, the rewards definitely are worth it. And I know I just I just feel like the Lord really prepared me quite specifically for what I'm doing today. For Mm -hmm. example, when I was 16, I read this book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, by Dale Carnegie. And in fact, I use it as a textbook for my vocal music education class at York. Mm. Because it was, I, I would tell them, I said, next to the Bible, this is the, the most important book I've ever read that helped me to, you know, accomplish so many of the things that I have today. And that was something that I read at the time. I don't even remember how I got that book in my hands, but, you know, it talks about so many things that I, I consider paramount, you know, and just if you're going to be involved with music with an ensemble and you don't enjoy interacting with people, then you need to do something else, you know? <laughs> If those interactions don't energize you, you need to do something else, right? If you don't enjoy speaking with people and being in conversation with people, I, the best meme I saw, I think, when I was coming up was a conductor with a, a baton in one hand and a phone in the other. Because mm. that is absolutely what we do. And, mm. and so many so many musicians, and this is what I tell my students, you think you're in here just going to learn about how to conduct? I said, you know what? If you don't learn the other piece, then you don't get to the conducting part. You just have turmoil and drama. So mm. you, need to, you need to take that seriously. And so I, you know, I talked to them about the very real um, struggle of the fact that I love music working with people, but I also hate about music working with people. Like it's a very, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. binary kind of existence. But um, but definitely, uh, as you learn and mature and how to um, hone and uh, craft those relationships um it is a beautiful beautiful thing hmm. that that's so interesting because i've never i never th- i've never thought about conducting that way like i think you know i've always assumed it's is just not that the, you're just waving your hands you're not you're keeping time you're keeping the group together and that's such an important role right that leadership but i've never thought about like the relation the relationships that go with that and just mm-hmm. how uh, important that is. And, and that is its own skill. It's its own skill set really to, Absolutely. to uh, handle <laughs> that many people's emotions and realities. And yeah. yeah. So do you, do you find uh, in your experience of conducting of leading uh, TMC as and other choirs uh, at York as well and the bands that go with them? Do you do you have you in your experience have you found that struggle is a necessary part of the process or is it something that kind of like ebbs and flows? Um, I think you need to, it's inevitable. You need to be aware that the struggle is inevitable. And not to see it as, you know, somehow, oh, I'm having difficulties. Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. No, Mm. it's part of it. If you're working with people, you have to expect it. But you must learn from it. If you keep repeating the same mistakes and don't learn from it, that's not good. (laughs) So so (laughs) I'm I'm so thankful that God is a gracious teacher. And he gave me specific moments that I can remember where I'd made a mistake. And I was able to rectify it and learn from it and then never do that again, you know, kind of thing, right? So, so I've been, you know, I would say I have been very fortunate, blessed to have not many public I- I mistakes. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and people, and a network of people who are uh, extremely supportive. And, uh, and again, you talked about mentorship and I've been blessed to have in all of my jobs, whether it was a church music director you know, or working at the, the bookstore I used to work at years ago, or as a teacher, uh, I'm, I've am i always had fantastic mentorship. I can't think of anyone, you know, in, the, in those that I've had in leadership. And that's very unusual, because sometimes we don't get great people that are, you know, our bosses. But I have every single time I've had wonderful people who remain my mentors today. Hmm. 
Yeah. I, and I think that's such an encouragement too, to those that are in positions like you are, where they're leading people and to say, Hey, like, who do I see that I can mentor? Who can I encourage along this path as well? And and not just be maybe insular in their talent and knowledge because um, mm-hmm. mentorship is so key and it is really truly what enables so much to happen is when you have a good a good mentor. I, I loved also what you said about um, expecting the struggles to come and that doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. And, <laughs> and I, I think that that is so wise because so often like we hit the struggle roadblocks or we that that bump in the road and things are no longer just smooth sailing you know no longer that that run in the meadow with you know all all those ideal situations and we think oh no I have it all wrong oh no like I'm in the wrong job I'm in the wrong calling or I can't do this I'm not equipped um but I love what you said that, you know, you should expect those things to come. It, it just made me think of, um, you know, there's a, in church, there's often that joke that we say, like, I'm going to be part of like the best, the most perfect church. And it's a church of one with just me in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, <laughs> you know, like, like the idea that like, as soon as you add more people, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be issues. <laughs> you know, if you want that perfect church, it'll be a church of one person there. And I, I get the sense that, uh, not dissimilarly, being in a choir and in a band uh, is similar to that. <laughs> if you want a perfect oh, choir, yeah. it's going to be a choir of one. <laughs> you're going to, if you want to have a band experience, a, 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 an ensemble experience, a choir experience, then you have to expect the struggle. Yeah, and it's going to be, you know, if again, if you learn from it, you're going to be better for it, and so will everybody else. You're going to become mm-hmm. a better leader. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that I was not a strong leader when I started. I mean, mm. I, I probably had the potential to be. Yeah. Um, I had the confidence to be, but I was not. <laughs> I was not. And I made, you know, I made mistakes. I'm just thankful that people have short, short memories, or at least they, <laughs> they, they act like they do. And, and I definitely was all about learning, all about learning and not repeating the same mistakes. So so I think that that's, you know, if you have that as your goal, you have a good chance of being mm-hmm. able to have some longevity and create lasting um, legacies. Yeah, no, that's so good. Um, and even in what you just said, right, being all about learning and, and, and maybe this, <clears throat> maybe this is true for you, but I know for myself, like, yeah, I went to school a while ago, <laughs> um, but I've never stopped learning. You know, and, and you're just going from knowledge to knowledge and experience to experience. And that is so important to being able to continue to do our jobs well. And with the passion that we have is that continued learning element uh, yeah. to our work. I, I think part of it is, too, is that I, I'm a person that gets very comfortable. You know, mm. I don't like change. <laughs> but you can't <laughs> learn without change, right? And so you talked about, you know, having those people in your life that draw you out. And I can, I can say very honestly that every career step that I've taken has been because someone has said to me, I would like for you to, to try this. I think you would be good at this because otherwise I would probably still be doing the same thing I was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. I just, I'm just like that. You know, I just like, I like sameness. I like, you know, <laughs> but I've learned, you know, that I am capable of more. I just need to step into it and embrace the learning. And that when I do, um, you know, things are better. I mean, this past year is a total example i'm sure everyone has experienced the things they've had to learn in order to survive this last year Mm -hmm. i you know if there are things that i I should have learned many years ago that i kept putting off because i was too busy yeah i had to learn and but man now i there's so many things that i can do and i'm expecting next year that i'm going to be able to use these things continue to use them even when we are on the other side of the pandemic i'll still be using these new skills and so you know, I'm thankful for the fact that I've had people in my life to draw me out and that I've learned the benefits of change and growth. Yeah. <laughs> As a leader, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, the you said you said it. The benefits of change and growth. They're huge. Mm-hmm. Um, so you sent some clips to share with us. And we're gonna start with this one uh, that's a Jamaican medley. Med- I don't know what is with my brain today. <laughs> it's no, it's a hard one, yeah. <laughs> medley. And you would think I would know that word really well because I grew up 
hearing it all the time. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> here we go. No the Lord is my provider. Me not go beg no bread. Yeah. Did songs I know I said this to you before we started the interview like they go on and on and on and like you just don't want the party to stop so it's like where do you stop the clip you know like that's the end of the song but it goes on for another two minutes (laughs) (laughs) the other part I always notice for myself is I hear that music I just I gotta dance I gotta move you know how do you stay still (laughs) yeah the joy the joy yes so why don't you tell us about the story of this song well, so this is going back a good 15 years, I'm thinking, um, when we were approached by Jane Andrus, uh, Jane and Brian Andrus. They are the uh, owners of a bed and breakfast in Niagara-in-the-Lake called Applewood Hollow. Um, and their ministry there, besides having this wonderful oasis for people, is has been to come alongside the immigrant farmer workers in, the, in Niagara-in-the-Lake and to be able to befriend them and to... Uh, speak up for them to look to look after their welfare, um, to minister to them, provide church connections to them, and they were basically doing this all by themselves. They didn't have a church that was working with them. And she heard Toronto Mass Choir on a CBC broadcast, and just thought that would be great if we could do this uh, workers' welcome concert. Um, and so we started doing the these concerts that she did when the migrant farm workers would come in from mostly Jamaica and Mm -hmm. would welcome them with the, you know, with this big concert. And we did it probably, I'm sure we've done it six or seven of them over the years. Um, But, you know, the joy, the joy. And, you know, these are people who are leaving their homes and their families for eight months of the year to basically work like they're just a little above a slave. I mean, they're, Mm -hmm. they're in these cabins away from the, you know, the big house, they're in these cramped quarters they have they working like 12 14 hour days sometimes in you know minus degree weather 
or the very hot sun with very, very little resources and and not much respect from the communities that they're mm. in. It's a, it's a very, very uh, difficult story. And Canada has to own this. You know, we're we're not doing very well by these by these workers. So we you know, we're not very much of a political type of choir. But this was a cause that we just could not um, walk away from. And we know we know Jane's heart. She's become a good friend over the years. And in fact, uh, she's she is. We were introduced to her through New World Sun. So we had, you know, we I think we went to the recording studio, and she happened to be there, and it was that kind of a coming together. But these guys, um, you know, they were so unusual. I mean, here were you know five white guys in a band <laughs> that were singing. You know, they loved part of what they did was singing this um, uh, Caribbean music. Mm -hmm. uh, because of their connection to um, Jane, because uh, one of the, the guys was her son, her son-in-law, um, and their work that was doing there, and the music they were learning from them. Wow! You know, and so they they learned this music, sort of, you know, helped to to take it out uh, out of where they were. Um, and when and when then we came together with them, it was just a huge explosion of love and ministry. And as you can see. The audience, uh, which was mostly about 600 uh, Margaret farm workers that they would just bust in from the different um, farms, they were just enjoying having fellowship, having music that they that they enjoyed, and they this wonderful welcoming atmosphere. And it was so contagious. You know, if, the, if you talk to the choir about these, and we just get this big goopy grin on our faces because it's just the most glorious you know, as close to heaven praise as you could get. Uh, just fantastic. And of course, you know, the, I'm not Jamaican. So the, 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 some of the choir members, including some of the guys in the band would, would, would laugh at me when I asked them, what does Bundem mean? What does that mean? Bundem. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, that means burn, burn. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, they're teaching me. And we're teaching each other and um, and having a great time. But it's been, um, I think the struggle for us has been, oh, I think over the years, just, you know, trying to figure out our place mm. um, in this called Christendom. Um, as you would notice, you know, TMC is not, everybody is not of African descent in the choir. Um, but they, you know, the requirement is that they have to have a missional heart that is opening, open to interacting with other cultures, you know, mm -hmm. with much love and respect. They also must not be demo, demo, denominationally focused. You know, I only am with this kind of Christian or this kind of Christian, but they have to be able to embrace Christians from all denominations, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in the early days, we experienced criticism from our contemporaries for being a mixed choir uh, because we didn't have, you know, it was like you have, you know, you know they're not all black. They, and, and people just didn't think we were a real gospel choir. But we realized that if when, as we re, re, remain dogged in our determination to continue to look like Toronto and be just who we are, that we are making not only a statement for Christendom, but also for cultural mm -hmm. you know, statement. What's possible when you lay those things down? What's possible? And we've been cited so many times for breaking down stereotypes, making people be able to have a visual representation of what heaven is like and so you know these have been the things that i've enjoyed uh the struggle of that trying to build our identity um in a world that would want us to be siloed um and and also uh, in this country particularly unaware of or unfamiliar with gospel choirs um and so we're reshaping stereotypes all the time but mm. it's been you know a journey of of joy I love that. I love that. I, you know, out of I don't, just for our viewers, we will put links in the description box um, of this interview of all of the videos that we're showing, so you can go and watch them in their entirety and enjoy them and experience them in their fullness. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I loved the exuberant joy that you could see in the audience members. <laughs> You know, and just the abundance and dancing and moving. And there was no thought of why I sat in this seat, so I need to stay in this space. <laughs> yeah. And and just how infectious that is. And I love how, what, even with what you're saying, there's that, that, that struggle of your identity as a choir. Like, you know, there's a, a five-piece white band. <laughs> 
singing these songs, having uh, leading how you know alongside TMC leading in this experience. Um, but that, as you said, like you know, in heaven there aren't those barriers, and we can appreciate and truly experience all these different cultures and how they worship God and how they just enjoy life. And mm-hmm. I love that, 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 that pursuit that you've had with TMC and that you've insisted really that this would be part of your DNA is really a bit of, of, of heaven on earth uh, taste. Yeah. And yeah. And it's not like we actually, you know, go out looking for people like, Oh, they must not be black kind of thing. But it, I think it's it's a testament to who we are that we attract people who enjoy mm-hmm. that type of ministry, that type of collective ministry. Mm-hmm. And I think other part of this um, is the whole idea of collaboration, because we, as a choir, gospel choir, um, have have enjoyed some such amazing collaborations with other artists over the years. And this collaboration, for example, with New World Sun was life changing for us as an organization. We had several times that we did concerts with them, our, our you know recorded with them and it if you if if that is not part of your struggle in terms of your identity um then you when it, these opportunities come up how do you decide who to collaborate with and who to, hmm. to not right but um we realized very early on that gospel choirs have the ability to do that you know we to come either behind or be the centerpiece or side by side you know so we've done uh We've had so many amazing collaborations with people like uh, the Toronto Symphony, the Toronto Jazz Orchestra, um, the Salvation Army, Canadian Staff Band, also other gospel artists like Michael W. Smith or uh, Whitley Phipps, Mark Mazury, but also non sort of gospel artists like Michael Burgess, John Hendricks, Lila Bialy, um, Josh Groban. So, it, you know, there's the opportunities come up, but until you decide who you are and what your mandate is and, you know, sort of where you draw the line with those things, then, you know, you can't make those decisions. But mm-hmm. I think we've you know, we've um, been able to have some very um, quality and lively and enduring collaborations over the years. So I appreciate I appreciate that. Wow, that is so cool. Um, all right, let's watch the second clip, which is Made for Worship. I'll keep saying it, you know, that was barely two minutes of a longer song that is just so beautiful, uh, led the soloist there is your daughter, Jenna, and um, she just has, has a beautiful voice. So why don't you tell us about this song? It's the title uh, track in an album that you guys did as well as the DVD. And yeah, tell us the story. Right. So when this project was being envisioned, my husband, who is often the visionary for the theme of our, our recordings, what really was struck by the Lord to make this that, that album, the theme of vertical worship. 
because so often what happens with gospel music it's about you know me or how i'm feeling or my connection to you know others or the corporate thing whatever but he really believed that this needed to be vertical uh the relate the the theme had to be vertical uh worship and so um we had the title made for worship before we sent out a call because we we wanted to have I mean, this needed to be a very Canadian project for our, just our own, we just wanted that. And we we wanted other artists, uh, sorry, other songwriters to be able to be contribute to the project. So my husband put out a call to Canadian gospel songwriters within our circle, people we knew, um, to write a song called Made for Worship. And it wasn't called Made to Worship, it was called Made for Worship. And we were very specific about that because we didn't want it, you know, made when, worship is not just a singular activity. You know, mm -hmm. it's something that you're created for, and that means that it, it 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 implies that it's something that permeates your entire being, your tasks, your life, your work, whatever. So, uh, so we called it Made for Worship. Sent that out and asked people to to submit songs that were based on that. And um, <laughs> uh, I think that by that time, TMC had been together about twenty years. Mm -hmm. And I know as we listened to different submissions, I think it was the first time that I really realized that TMC had just started to develop our own sound. You know, mm -hmm. and and this album also re reaffirmed our commitment to worship. Um, that 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 commitment was not really solidified until about ten years after we began, and I think that you know this album really cemented that. And I think as we heard Jenna's version, and she was our daughter, but you know, <laughs> we just wanted the best thing, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we knew right away when we heard the song that that was what spoke the heart of the choir. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jenna is a great songwriter as well as a soloist, as you heard, and uh, not surprisingly, someone who understands the heart of TMC. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, it was uh, some people brought, you know, songs that were like more up tempo, they were more anthemic. But and this was just a, 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 you know, just a statement, a statement of fact. And um, and so uh, when she brought the song to us, you know, when we were to, to, talking to the choir and of course it became the title cut um as we had hoped it would um and our 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 judgment of the song was also um confirmed because the song won song of the year by the canadian gospel music association so wow so we had, we had a good thing and so did so did they obviously <laughs> yeah and th that's so interesting um what you were saying about um asking for submissions and realizing that tmc has its own sound and its own it developed its own style um can you can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how easy is it for people to step into the style that you've created? I think that that's a very good question because we don't often um, ask for outside submissions. I think that that experience taught us that that it, it, if somebody's going to write for the choir, just because of the fact that we're such a collective, an unusual collective of people. I mean, where else you're going to find? a group of people that are singing gospel music, which is, you know, in itself very unique in this country, but also, you know, coming from so many different walks of life, different denominations. I mean, Baptist, Pentecostal, you know, Catholic. I mean, it's like, you know, it's everybody, right? <laughs> so how do you, how do you get an, a voice that's a, that's a unified voice? And, and so it's taken us some years to be able to, develop that and I think too because gospel music in Canada is developing its own voice and I and I I'm thankful we've also been at the forefront of that the recordings that we've been doing over the past uh 32 years um have helped establish a Canadian sound I believe and mm -hmm. one of the things too that we know is that in Canada the gospel sound is much more influenced by jazz and our Caribbean um culture than our neighbors to the south so when we go to sing in, in the States, you know, who has a very long history of, mm -hmm. of and very bold uh, gospel music industry, they will say to us, wow, your, your, your sound, like, it's so different. What is that? And I was saying, yeah, we're Canadian, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, they don't really hear a lot of that. And so, um, I mean, it's getting better and better, but I believe that uh, we we actually do not just TMC, but I think you know the the community that's here is developing its own sound, which I am very very excited about. And um, yeah, I think it, it it was a good that that whole experience and and all of the albums that we've made to date. I think we have about uh, fourteen 
actually. Mm. Um, they've all been increasingly honing that sound and that um, uh, that commitment to you know what whatever the DNA of TMC is, what it, what it has become. Yeah, I love that. I love how, from what I'm hearing you say, uh, this title track, Made for Worship, was really almost like that culmination or that coming together of of who you are as a choir and that solidific, you know, that it being solidified as to this is TMC and how we sound and this is our Canadian heritage. And there's all these moments that kind of just like build on on that uh, that. But this was really like a, a that coming together, converging moment in in, in music, and that's that's beautiful. Yes, absolutely, and I think too, even that's this the fact that the song made for worship, that statement made for worship, mm-hmm. is also a declaration of who TMC is. Mm-hmm. You know, and and we uh, we we've, we've come to be known as that. Mm-hmm. Uh, not all gospel ensembles are you know make that their claim, their you know their statement of who they are, their raison d'être. But they they this is this has definitely been become our stamp, and where I think really really we live collectively most comfortably in terms of our expression of faith. Yeah, that's so beautiful. All right, let's watch um, the third song we have uh, to worship you. It's like the the party never stops. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That is right. <laughs> I I was watching that song um, in preparation and trying to pick out a moment or two, and I was struggling so hard because there were just so many like great moments. And again, we'll put the uh, the link to all of these songs in the description box so you guys can. You guys can watch them and enjoy them. It is well worth the watch. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could share with us about the struggle to continually offer a sacrifice as of praise as a corporate group, um, singers and musicians. And, and how do you lead? How do you lead in that? Wow. Um, I think that's never been more apparent than this past year when you had to almost uh re reevaluate not even reevaluate but reaffirm what your mandate is because i if you're a gospel choir or any kind of a group and the only thing that holds you together is the music you know you could not have survived this year because we're not able to do it and especially with a gospel choir i mean 
our whole way of performing, <laughs> you know, it's not to, to stand, you know, uh, six feet apart with masks on and, and hold sheet music. Gospel music depends on proximity in order mm. for it to work. You know, we learn our music by rote, you know, we, we feed off each other's energy and it's whole body singing. So we're together, our faces are, are you know, very <laughs> engaging. And um, it, it, this has been the most uh, opposite type of environment for a gospel choir to, to be. And so we had to really think about, you know, and, and, and really struggle with what is, what do we do, right? Mm -hmm. what, who are we? Mm -hmm. and, and I think this year has been a wonderful time to remind ourselves of who we are and what it is where we, we, God has placed us here to do and to find another way to define praise and worship. You know, how do you, as a gospel choir, how do you do that? How do you <laughs> redefine it, right? Um, but, you know, I mean, we've got so many people in the choir that have been with us some for the whole 32 years, many over 20 years. Uh, some of them are so new that they were, they had, they were just going to start their first concert <laughs> three weeks before COVID. Wow. And their, their, their robe is still hanging in the closet. They haven't even been able to put it on yet. So we've got all these different people that have been in suspended animation. And I think that if they hadn't had the singular motivation of that, this is a ministry it's not just a musical ensemble. We wouldn't have been able to survive as long, you know, this long. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere fast either. So, you know, it's going to be continue to be proven. But we have found other ways to worship him. So, um, of course, we've done, we did the virtual videos like every choir does. You know, we've done that. In fact, we have another one coming out with the Power Up uh, Gospel and Workshop Mass Choir that's coming out this month. Um, and we've done our Zoom worship gatherings which have been great. I mean, you can't hear each other, but do you need to hear other people in order to worship? This is the question, right? Right? Wow. So we had to do that to yourself. Uh, we, we would um, have uh, this, like we've been working on background recordings for our new project, which is a hymn recording. And that's been wonderful to be able to look at these hymns through the, a new prism and to, to sort of virtually think about how the choir is going to sound as we're making these arrangements. I mean, that's something new. Um, also service, you know, a service in, in missions is a big part of who we are. We were just about to go on a mission trip to Cuba, which of course got canceled because of COVID. And so, you know, what do you do with all of that? Well, what you do is you, you try to figure out other ways to impact the community. So this past Christmas, you know, really difficult, no singing. What do you do? So we created a Christmas video package, a 30 minute video package that where we had uh, people from the choir insert encouraging messages throughout um, videos that we had of ourselves of Christmas songs that we have done in the past. And then we distributed these to long, long term care homes and to people who were shut in as a way of giving them, um, you know, encouragement and the gift of music and a reminder that people are, you know, they care and that, you know, that God cares about them. So, you know, that was something I was really happy that we were able to do and made us feel as if we're, you know, we're still in the game. And then, of course, Power Up, which I mentioned, we a big gospel music conference that we do annually. The 17th annual conference this year was three weeks. It ended three weeks just prior to the shutdown. Wow. <laughs> we just got it in the last week of February. And then two weeks later, everything was shut down. So, but it was online. Um, and, and we had... Sorry, let me let me go back. That was last year. Power up. We had it last year just before it got shut down. And then this year we wanted to do it again. And so we had it online and mm. we didn't know what it would look like. But wow, it was amazing. People just superlatives. They just could not believe how much fun they had, how much they learned, even when it was online. So, you know, these are the things that um, have helped us to, you know, dig deep into our mandate dig deep into who we are mm -hmm. and that's that 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 reworking of who we are it's still a sacrifice a phrase but it's it's it, it you have to um reimagine you know you have to reimagine what that's going to look like yeah i i, I love that i i think that actually something that you said near the beginning there that challenged me <laughs> was do you need to hear people to worship together <laughs> you know <laughs> 
<laughs> and it, you, the gut instinct is like, yeah, you do. <laughs> but then going, wait a second. Well, maybe I don't. And maybe these other experiences are just as meaningful, especially in the season that we're in. And, um, you know, I'm hearing you say like part of offering up the sacrifice of worship, it is the action, the action of sacrifice of going, okay, what can we still do? What can we still offer? And we're going to do that no matter what. Um, and and so it's, it's really interesting because it's just a completely different way of thinking about it. Um, and it, it's it's really shifting the whole conversation, orientating it completely differently. Um, yeah. So what would what would you say in your experience, especially as we think about worship um, and in light of you know what we've just been discussing, what's the difference between uh, personal struggle versus corporate struggle? I think that um, as artists, you know, it, it's always going to be personal. I mean, you, you know, you bring your whole self to the table and that kind of um, working out who you are as an artist, what your purpose is, what has God gifted you to do? Those questions are answered in part in your secret time, you know, in your private time with the Lord, but they're also worked out in community as you know, as you bring your, your talents together and, and then you have this whole, like that's obviously bigger than, than anything you could do by yourself. So I think that it's, it's a combination of both and it's a, it's a, an opportunity. It's a beautiful opportunity when you have both of these things happening. And this is why we ask our uh, singers, our choristers to be, to make sure that they're involved in vibrant um worship communities and staying in, connected with their churches you know we're not a replacement for a church but we're mm-hmm. you know we have to get that nurturing so that we have something to bring back to the team mm-hmm. and that we strengthen each other and encourage each other um in you know in what is a very you know can be it's very new it's very out there you know very visible <laughs> um in the street and um you know people think somehow when you're you know, on a platform that's higher than them, or you're on TV, or something that you somehow some magic uh, knowledge about how to to make a Christ life work. But you know, we're all working that out, and mm-hmm. I love the fact that they are willing to do that. You know, with a public face, with the responsibility that comes with that, and also you know an awareness of just you know how powerful this ministry can be when we are intentional. Mm -hmm. about how we use that, you know, that message, this medium, and all these wonderful opportunities that we've been afforded. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. And I I love it because my second question, which you kind of already answered is, uh, how does personal struggle integrate into the corporate? But you've already said that. You've already talked about how, (laughs) you know, it is about that bringing of what's going on in your own home to the corporate and continue that, continue working it out then together in community. And, oh, that's so beautiful. Well, before we uh, go, I have a couple of extra questions I want to ask you. And these are questions that we ask all of our guests. um, And it's so interesting how people answer these questions. So uh, first question is, what is one encouragement or practice you would give artists? So you mean all artists or just Christian artists? All artists? Uh, you can answer that however you want. <laughs> okay, teacher. Uh, okay, so I would say for all artists, you know, building a great support system. Because no one gets to move into these spheres of influence or these elevated visible platforms without help. You know, you have to build a great support system. And you know, reach out and, you know, people who have done whatever you're doing, people that you admire, uh, talk to them, ask questions, you know, sit at their feet, you know, be a servant, you know, carry their water, like figure out what's going on and try to, to, um, to engage, you know, with people who have experience and then also people who are like-minded, who, who understand your vision and want to, you know, to come together with it. So I just say that support system is like number one. And then uh, specifically for Christian artists, I would daily devotions, you know, 
this provides the, the most important skill that a, a musician, a Christian musician needs and is wisdom. Mm. You know, beyond musical skill and a deep relationship with the Lord, of course, wisdom, in my estimation, is the key to success. Mm. And you don't get there on your own. You know, I believe that the Lord is the architect of our wisdom. We, you, he said, if we ask it, he will give it to us. And those instructions, I mean, Proverbs, it's like, you know, it should be just rewritten in musician's handbook. You know, there's just, it's so much wisdom in the scriptures and it writes you, it, 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 and that daily talk and walk with the Lord just gives you grounding that helps you to move out there. And especially in days like this, there was just so much shifting sand. There's no precedence for what we're doing. You know, where do you get this information? Where do you, where do you get it? You, you can't even look to the people that are, that you admire because they're still struggling too, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know what to do either. So I would just encourage those people who are, um, uh, are called to their, their artistry through the gifts that God has given them is to really, um, make time for those daily devotions. Nice. Yeah. And one or more, if you have a couple um, artists, other artists to check out and why. Right. I, I, you know, and it's interesting because I don't, I listen to a lot of different types of music. I don't just listen to gospel music. A lot of people would think I only do what I don't, but I do have uh, people around, you know, all around. So I would say from people who label themselves as a Christian artist, I lo love CC Winans. Oh, she's so good. And, yeah, I love Cece Winans. I've met her, um, you know, it was many years ago, so she wouldn't remember me, but, um, and Whitley Phipps, uh, W-I-N-T-L-E-Y, Whitley Phipps. He's most famous for, if people have ever seen on Facebook, that Amazing Grace um, video that he does where he, he explains where it came from, the song came from, and he sings it. But he is somebody I've known for years, and his, his mantra is, you don't have to compromise to be recognized. This man has sung, he's a Canadian, but he lives in, in uh, where were you, Karen? Uh, Florida, he lives in Florida. Um, but he's somebody who, like CeCe Winans, navigates the world with their Jesus skin on. Mm. Um, they don't, they're not trying to slip in there and, you know, and they have a real international view of their ministry, right? Uh, so they're, you know, their, their ministry has carried them to places far and abroad, their own comfort zone or own communities so I enjoy those two and then um another person who I, I love who is not a, who is an artist that's not labeling herself as a Christian artist but she is a Christian and that's Lila Bayali and mm -hmm. she's a jazz artist um she award-winning she won Juno last year um she embodies her faith um but she doesn't you know she doesn't move in the world as a Christian artist she's a grid friend and someone I have huge huge respect for um, and then just as a general jazz artist, I love Gregory Porter. If you don't know Gregory Porter, get to know Gregory Porter's music. You know, his mama was an evangelist and you can hear it through his music. And he's an amazing uh, songwriter as well as his voice. It's kind of like a blend between Lou Rawls and Nat King Cole. Like, wow. you can't get any. So those would be the people I would ask, tell people, check them out. I have a whole list now <laughs> of other artists. And little fun fact, uh, I actually had my bridesmaids walk down the aisle to see C. Winans Without Love. And uh, oh. yeah, we just did a little groove down the aisle. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I love, I love CC Winans. She is so good. Okay. So the last thing that we want to do with you is I've got my phone here and we're going to put two minutes on the clock. And we're going to do a speed round. So you want to answer these questions as fast as possible. We're going to see how quickly we can answer as many questions. So here, hang on a second. Okay, here we go. What is your next project? Hymns recording with TMC. Most inspirational artist for you? CC1 is going to stick with her. <laughs> uh, what's your dream project? Uh, my own project. Yeah. I, I think that's a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you could have coffee with anyone in the world, past or present, not Jesus, who would it be? Easy. Harriet Tubman. Hmm. Favorite childhood toy? Oh, my little tape recorder. <laughs> First movie or play that was meaningful to you? Raisin in the Sun. Hmm. 
77, I think. <laughs> Fill in the blank. I'm happiest when I'm... Cooking. Nice. And I need to create. Space. Mind space. Mm-hmm. Favorite midnight snack? Oh, anything with cheese. <laughs> You're not the first person to say that one. <laughs> uh, if you're going to read or listen, book or audio book? Book. Yeah. Fries or salad? Salad. Burger or taco? Burger. Nice. And you know what? This is the first time that we've made it through all the questions without running out of time. <laughs> When you ask old people, like we 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 know these things. We just always ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, thank you, Karen, for being so generous with your time for coming on Unlock the Story and just breaking down for us a little bit about what it means to be a choir director and the role of struggle as you lead a team of musicians and singers and. I know I have been so blessed by TMC and the work that you've done. Uh, I cannot believe you've been at York for 16 years. That just seems a little mind-blowing to me. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm so excited for the things that are coming next. I love hymns. I love gospel music. So I am definitely going to be getting that album as soon as it is released um, because that just ticks so many boxes for me. And thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.